A few of you were here last year, uh, and yes, you were seeing the same slide. The intent here is there's a lot that's going on in this space. Uh, as many of you know, I've been at this for a long, long time. And some of the things used to keep me up at night 20 years ago, I'm still thinking about today because we haven't quite gotten it right. So last year, there were six themes. A couple of cases here, if, if you recall what I talked about, it's kind of a variation on a particular theme. But these are the six new topics that many of you and other clients and colleagues uh, have been talking to me about. And so I wanted to share it with you. And again, as Dave said, <clears throat> the theme of this conference is engaged. So if you have a thought, just cut me off at any point, share it. And if it's not now, then I'll look forward to it and we'd have to think later. Okay, so please, this is a very open two-way form. So let's talk about the first. Uh, oh, wait a minute. I think we've gone too far. We're going to get there. So this is still a big problem. And I think it's a problem likely for all of the very nice brands that are represented in this room. This idea of mo moving from transactional to conversational, I've got three high-level thoughts here. In the last two weeks alone, I've spoken to some pretty great brands. Even last night, I was trying to check in Lynn to her hotel, and things went a little choppy. And what I'm finding is still a challenge for most of our frontline employees who are doing this very, very difficult work. It doesn't matter about industry or geography. It's how to read how the customer's feeling in that moment and just getting a little bit better at being empathetic. So for me, as I start off this theme, the transactional to conversational, I don't want to hear about the mix of reasons why you can't help regurgitating a process, this is how we do it. It's incredible to me that that's still the default for so many employees. So the notion here is, how do I engage even if someone's in a tough spot? And there are ways to break that ice and do it effectively. So that first thought is really about engaging. And for me, it starts from a place of empathy. The second one, developing targeted training and coaching programs. So. Frontline employees don't all know this instinctively. I think some do, which is part of their DNA in terms of their persona, but they need help. And this notion of soft skills, whatever language you would like to use, emotional EQ, in many ways it has to be taught. So your training teams need to really be thinking about, do I have the right approach? Do I have the right content? Is there enough role playing and real life experience that's helping some who are doing this work for the very first time, how to truly make meaningful connections. It's not easy, but this is for me what I think the focus needs to be. And then finally, this idea of boundaries of talk time. We've got some very smart, strategic WFM um, people in this room who run very large scale organizations. It's not easy. I get cost control and containment and concern, but if frontline employees have a tight boundary on how long they can spend talking to someone, it becomes harder to make those meaningful connections. So that's the connection I'm trying to make here. Focus all that effort on process and systems. And like I've said to many of you who we do work with, it's all about the hold and the wrap. It should have nothing to do with the talk time. Getting that right is going to save multiple callbacks. It's going to drive increased sales. And I would challenge anyone to find me a business case where if you had higher talk time, you wouldn't have reduced cost for so many other different reasons. So those are my thoughts on moving from the transactional to the conversational. It feels to me anyway that we still have quite a ways to go. I'm going to go through three and just pause and see if anyone has any thoughts. If you're not going to just jump out, that's OK, too. So the second one, we're going to get into this quite a bit on the panel. Um, there isn't a client or a colleague who hasn't asked me a question on, so what are we doing to keep our talent? What makes, and I'm just using this for frame of reference, what makes Scotia different than CIBC? Right? What makes Laurentian different than Kensington Tours or TSX Trust? Yes, there are different brands, different size, different history, different people. But ultimately, how to treat people and make them feel like they're really connected to a community that's kind of the same. So what needs to be done to make you a more attractive hire 
and to keep employees from leaving, which I know is still a struggle for so many. So that's the genesis of this. We've started to do quite a bit of work. I touched on this last year in terms of developing these employee journeys. Um, and so what I challenge you to be thinking about is just a couple of thoughts along this work that we've been doing. The first is, there's two experiences for an employee. It's not really just one. In our eyes, there's the candidate experience, right? So what's that first touch point look like when Scotia reaches out to me because they'd like to bring me in for an interview? And what does that continue to feel like as a candidate before I'm hired? That's all candidate. Recruitment, all of that is candidate experience. The interviews, the, pers the profiles that I might go through, how well people stay in touch with me and they stay connected, all of that, one part of the organization. Then the employee experience starts from day one. And that's when we start moving into these notions of cultural pillars and moments that matter. Great cultural pillars, appreciation. Everyone in this room works for a brand that I am sure has some form of appreciation for employees. But is it meaningful? If I were to meet all of your employees, would they all say resoundingly, boy, I really do feel appreciated? What does appreciation look like? These are some of the really important questions I think leaders need to be asking themselves regularly to chart the right course that's going to work for your teams. So, appreciation, environment, these are cultural pillars. Just a couple of examples. Moments that matter. So this one's a little different. A lot of you probably heard about this expression, moments of truth, which has to do with when during the customer's experience do they experience something really meaningful that changes how they feel about a brand. That happens, it's language that we all know. The moments that matter here are very similar, but they reflect on the employee. So did you celebrate someone because they recently got married or they, they did some form of, they did an MBA in their spare time, got an executive MBA, what did that feel like when you celebrated that success? When you were promoted, if maybe you were able to do something really spectacular in terms of performance. So these moments that matter across both personal and professional journeys, and they reflect back together on the experience. So that's just some insight into what we mean by cultural pillars and moments that matter. And then finally, probably the most popular word that seems to make our nomenclature today, post-pandemic, is flexibility. And how do you do that in a context center, especially one that might have, you know, 5,000 people? Not so easy from a WFM standpoint, especially when you think about work from home in office. But that's one of the big things that frontline employees are looking for. Which employer is going to give me the flexibility I need to also be a parent and or whatever other responsibilities I might have at home. So, a few thoughts on creating different employee experience. We're gonna get into this with the panel. I've got an additional eight to 10 questions. So there'll be lots of uh, extra input and perspective. And then finally, for this first page, um, so technology is, I'll use this word, it's becoming really sexy these days. I mean, some of the technology in our space is really not sexy, i.e. IVR, nothing sexy about it, right? I mean, <laughs> I'm looking at Steve, but I could look at Rakesh too. It's necessary, or Eric, but it's not sexy. Chat, SMS, messaging, chat, GPT, it's literally becoming really sexy talk in terms of our space. That's fine. But I, I want to call out the IVR first because what I'm finding is these IVRs are still very broken. And they're more broken for bigger companies than smaller. They're beastly to manage. Um, I did a lot of work for JD Power for years where I'd walk into companies and just assess their IVR and 99 times out of 100, they would not come close to meeting best practice criteria. It is hard stuff, fully understood. I wanted to share a couple of learnings both from that work and some of the work that we do in helping clients with their IVR. So for Touchstone or DTMF, I was trying to save space, not to test everyone's acronym knowledge. Um, a couple of things to think about. Fewer op options, shallow, narrow. This is a true story. I'll leave the brand nameless. I called into a brand recently at the main menu. Someone want to guess how many options there were? Just call it a number. Nine. That was pretty good, by the way. Nine options today in 2023 for an IVR. Best practice, by the way, is three. Who else said three? <laughs> Lynn. 
<laughs> Lynn's probably got an edge on me and most of what I talk about is a little unfair, but anyway. So three is best practice, this company had nine. And when I listened to all nine, I thought, boy, redundant, redundant, unnecessary, redundant. Now I did call them to see if they might need some support and they're thinking about that. And it's a brand that would really surprise you if I shared it, but I'll leave it nameless. And the other thing is self-serve. This is an, an interesting one because I think it also depends on your customer and your brand. I'm all about customers getting their channel of choice. And if they don't want to deal with an IVR, I don't believe purely from a customer standpoint, they should have to. But if you're one of our big five banks and you have X millions of calls coming in, you're kind of hoping that those self-serve channels are going to be helpful. So the notion here is where does self-serve come into play and how can it be optimized? And I think you really need to be thinking long and hard and doing in-depth analysis to figure that out. Finally, just a thought on NLP. A uh, few of you in this room are already on this journey uh, for natural language processing and IVR. Uh, we worked with a client out of the States in the insurance space uh, about three months ago. They're doing some really terrific work. Happy to facilitate an introduction, by the way, if you want to see someone who's doing NLP that's starting to work and work well. But there's a huge but here. The technology is there, but it needs to be handheld really closely. So it's deployed successfully. So a few thoughts that I have here, make sure you know what it is that you want to use this for. This is not like speech recognition. It's actually much more intuitive and gets as close to human as we can. We'll get into this a little bit more with uh, conversational AI. But the key is, do you have the right partner and how are you going to go about doing it? So there really needs to be a healthy strategy. It's not okay just to say, I'm going to go with NLP. I think it's the right thing to do because it's trending. It's not. I've seen another big insurer fail miserably when they didn't introduce it the right way. So you need to be very thoughtful and have the right strategic partner to do it. So let me pause for a sec. A lot of information coming your way. Any thoughts as I pick up this battery cover? Any comments? Anything? No? Everyone's good? OK. How are we on time, by the way? Yeah. We're good on time? I've got till? Uh, I've got 20, uh, 15. 15. Oh, good. OK, good. Making sure. OK, so for the next three, um, this is a question I'm sure some of you are trying to, some of you, sorry, if it's not being held high enough, just let me know. Is this OK? You guys can hear in the back? OK, thanks, Jeff. Um, Let's talk about post-pandemic world, uh, in-home, in-office, hybrid. Um, this seems to be a conundrum for many. Uh, I know, you know, RBC made a pretty bold move when their CEO said everyone's coming in three days a week. People I've spoken with at RBC, either clients or colleagues, not so happy about that. The other banks, I think, have made the right choice, kind of hanging back <laughs> and seeing what RBC does moving forward. But um, this notion of what's good and what's not. I thought I'd just share a few thoughts that feel to me are the things that are advantages for each of the scenarios. So this first one, working from home, I do believe you can get better productivity. This notion of wider geographic access is huge because now you get access to employees that if you're not in a physical location, you couldn't before. And then finally, of course, there is real estate savings. So those are a few key advantages for working from home. On the in-office front, what's becoming clear is it's really hard to replicate culture and community from home. So I'm hearing a lot of stories from senior leaders who say, I, I just can't get people connected. Communication is harder. People feel isolated. They're losing their sense of community. It's not as much fun to work here. 20 plus years ago, that was the pillar and reason why I wanted to stay in this industry was because being inside a contact center was actually really exciting. So I think that is remains a huge advantage for those of you that are wanting to bring people back. This for me is one of the big reasons. The other two is I kind of hit ease of support and then this notion of side by sides. My favorite thing to do as a contact center leader was just to sit down with an employee, have a chat, listen to a few calls, look at the screens, understand how the tech is working. That for me was the like gold. It's just not the same to do that virtually. So those are a few things on that front and then bringing them all together. Did someone have something? No, I thought I heard something, okay. And then bringing them together in terms of hybrid, there's no real easy answer, not for me anyway. Uh, I think part of this just comes down to understanding what your employees want and what will they accept. Uh, one leader for uh, 
another bank that's not here today, told me recently, Eli, I just had to decide to make it hybrid because we, couldn't, we were stuck in sand and we were losing the community and culture, which is, in this particular brand's case, paramount to who we are. And so we just said, you got to come in X number of days a week and this is what we're doing. And he's still working through the impact of that, but he felt it was the right call to make. They couldn't come to a consensus. So if you can find the right balance on your own, that's great, but in some cases, you might just have to make a hard choice. Number five of six, uh, building an omni-channel experience. So this for me also remains a very difficult task, especially for larger enterprises who are trying to create this one consistent experience. I will sometimes test some of these brands and I will find that my chat experience versus my email or phone in particular, even online, everything feels different. And so one of the things that we like to suggest is before you go down this path, or even if you're already down it and you haven't done it, please decide or define what it is you want to do with these channels. Have a strategy, have an approach. All the dots need to link. And as you're doing that, make sure that you have the right technology because just because there's a contact site or a cloud solution that does everything, it doesn't mean that their chat solution is gonna be as good as their telephony and IVR solution. So you might have to really think about, can I depend on, let's say, Genesis, for example, for everything, or do I have to be a bit more nuanced around the different choices that I'm making? That's not a plug for Genesis, by the way, just top of mind, okay. Um, and then the other piece is the talent I wanted to call out. I still think that the skill set to run email versus chat versus phone, it feels and looks a little different. So I just wanted to reiterate that you're looking for somewhat different talent. Generation Z, I would almost expect, without typecasting a generation, they're gonna be pretty good at any type of SMS or chat capability because they live off a of phone. When I grew up, there was no phones. <laughs> So I've always felt better on the phone or with a mic in my hand. I, I think that there's some differences there. And then finally, this notion, and by the way, it's easy for me to write down this line that says accountability, one channel, one experience. It is extraordinarily difficult to do. Okay, this is, Jesus, this is just words on a page. It takes a team of really smart people to test and learn their way through how to build an omni-channel approach that works. You might need help to do it, Great, we can have a conversation about that, but ultimately there needs to be a lot of thought on how to do this the right way. And then finally, you need the right success measures. So as most of you know, and have, we've been lucky enough to have you participate in, we do a lot of benchmarking, and we've found that we've got a really good sense of what we think the right measurements are. The right measurement for an IVR versus phone, email, chat, they all look a little different. So it needs to be really thought through as to which is the right way to measure across channels. Okay, and finally, before we get to the long-anticipated conversational and generative AI, which I'll try to bring a little bit of clarity to, just a little bit, we'll have that conversation. Um, just carrying on on performance for a little bit, I wanna talk a little bit more about how we think about measurement. So the first thing is, we would encourage you to think about categorizing measurements into dimensions. So as you think about attrition, well, that's clearly an employee metric, let it sit there. You could have an engagement statistic in there as well. You could have many. As you think about customer, well, that's where CSAT, NPS, that's where those are gonna fit in. And then for efficiency, you've got so many others. You might be thinking about containment rate, AHT, whatever it might be. We find in our experience when you can categorize, it makes it a little easier to track, measure, and report. The second thing is, we've been measuring certain KPIs for the last 30 years. And if those measurements work, then measure it the same way because it's likely that your peers already are. Like service level has one measurement and for the most part, I should, let me, re let me refer. You could measure it different ways, but for most of us who do it one way, that's likely the way that it should be done and it means you can benchmark in and out of industry. It doesn't have to be with us, it could be with anyone, although we'd prefer that it was with us. Um, at least you're gonna be able to benchmark the right way. It's an apples to apples comparison. And then finally, um, Lynn's gonna get into this a little bit in her presentation, but 
there are some newer KPIs that are coming into play, and I just wanted to share a few of them that, and I don't suggest there's one finite way to do this, but customer effort is something that I'm seeing a lot in the industry. So coming up with a way to quantify that and make sure it's measurable, we think is a smart thing. So I'd call it a customer effort score that is an actual numeric output. We talked about empathy. I think soft skills need to be measured. I know it's qualitative. It's not an easy thing to do, but through your quality program or speech analytics, even AI, finding a way to put something that's numeric against how good empathy is that takes at least some of the subjectivity away, I think is important because it really creates solid accountability and it helps frontline employees know what they should be trying to achieve. And then finally, we do this as part of our benchmark. So in my work with JD Power, I got very comfortable with certain data points. And there's a reality that suggests as soon as I'm waiting one minute in queue, there's a correlation to what MPS or CSAT's gonna look like. When I get to two minutes, and by the way, clearly the trend is going down and one is going up. So I wait two minutes, it's going further down. At the three minute mark, you're into some degree of notable pain in terms of CSAT. So keep, and for some of you, you've come out of, in all industries, ASAs that would have been way higher than three minutes. But now we're seeing a lot of recovery, especially in financial services, which is terrific. Three minutes is still the magic marker before things start to go off the rails. Once you get to five, you're having to recover um, your MPS and CSAT. And beyond that, Forget it. You're gonna have to do some really magical work, make those meaningful connections and be empathetic even more so uh, to win those customers back. So let me pause for a sec. Um, yes, Mallory. Oh, a question. Awesome. I have, I have a thought. <laughs> or a thought. Yes, please. Experience. Yes. Um, It's a good word. Don't hate it. It works. Love it. Um, <laughs> it's good. It's good. Yeah, and so I'm, I'm clearly, like, it's not going to work for every organization, but if, if you can have kind of a tool that you can use that will help you with your customer. I think it's a super observation. And I do think, for those of you working for smaller companies, I, I do think it's a little easier. Like, you really do have less excuse to not be connected internally because there's fewer of you. And so it should be a little easier. I think for the large enterprises in this room, you know, Mallory, you make a great point. And I think it applies to anything. The contact center historically has been an outcast, right? Th that, that's the reality. Nowadays, things are changing. It's still a work in progress. Our, our space is not perceived in a really positive light. I have potential clients, this recently just happened, Dave and I were there together, where they said to us, We'd prefer it if you wouldn't refer to what we have here, which is a number of frontline employees who are actually on the phone interacting, which, you know, between us is a contact center, that we won't use the word contact center because of how it's perceived by the employees. So for me, I'm thinking, well, if we do work with this company, let's make sure that they're educating and helping the, the rest of the organization understand how important, meaningful, and special the work that we do is. And it comes from those partnerships. Yes, Lynn, please. Yep. Experience consultant. It made a huge difference. What you call people makes a huge difference. And yep. how they feel about the work that they do, whether they're going to give you discretionary effort, whether or not they're going to be able to live into what you want, which is sort of those things about providing options and solutions, being knowledgeable, treating the customer's value, being empathetic. Mm -hmm. But you have to look at it from your brand and bring that all the way down to what is it that you want 
your frontline employees represent, and then choose the names. We moved all of our leaders, you know, previously they're called supervisors, we moved them all to coaches. Mm -hmm. They were all coaches. It really changes the mindset a lot. And mm -hmm. when you looked at our scores, we didn't really have time to burn in on the training and all the other things that went along with that. Just those two moves dramatically improved our CSAT scores. It, it was amazing. The company was horrible in case anybody was. Yes, it was. <laughs> and a great experience working there, no pun intended. Thank you for sharing. That's great. Good. Okay, so Dave, how am I on time? I just want to be thoughtful. Uh, Five minutes? minutes? Oh, okay. All right, any other thoughts, comments? I hope that was helpful. I know they're very broad strokes, but these are the things that I'm thinking a lot about and a lot of uh, our clients we're fortunate enough to work with and just partners and colleagues have been sharing the same. So today I wanted to start things off and please flag me down if you want to talk at length at any one of these topics. Okay. Let's try to bring a little bit of clarity here. So I'm actually very comfortable on the first part. It's the second part where I'm going to use some cheat notes here that um, Ankit, part of our team, has helped me doing some research on uh, generative AI. But let's talk about conversational AI, because it's been around for a while. It's not quite as new. There's a couple of you in this room who know this topic really quite well. What I wanted to do is try to bring some clarity to what's different between the two. And really, if I were to summarize it this simply, uh, and Ankit, you can, course, you can correct me at any point here if I miss this, but Conversational AI for me is mostly a real-time interaction where really sophisticated technology, and in this case, automated speech recognition, natural language understanding if you can't see in the back, dialogue management, and natural language generation are all working together to help either an IVR, for example, give me an answer if it's NLP enabled. It could be a chat, but ultimately, it's a real-time interaction for the, in, in the best possible way to mimic how a human wants to be spoken to, but it's an actual bot. That for me in layman terms, the best as I can articulate it, is conversational AI, it's real-time. Generative AI, it's a little different. It's, it's exploded on this much more mature, moment starts in time, but there's this learning mechanism some, an offshoot on this, we've got training models, language processors, and, and sorry, we've got, let me try and pronounce this, Adversari adversarial networks, transformers, and variational autoencoders, for any techies in the room, this is the actual language. But basically that stuff mixes together. From a moment in time, you start a chat GPT interaction, the learning starts, and it never stops. So there's this continuum that's taking place that's constantly evolving and maturing, and that's the piece which has people really excited. Once it's properly regulated and customized in the right way, to be really effective. And even from my experience, it does, it is impressive to type in X and get back all this detail. The more that I type in on the same topic, the more mature and the smarter it gets, and that's the difference, at least as far as how I would try and articulate it. So very, very high level view, one to the other. And let me just, I'm actually gonna share a couple other thoughts because they were written down. But any additional comments just as we get into this a bit more? Yes, Heather, please. Yeah. That's a great point. Everyone catch that? that? Sorry, Heather, there was some stuff going in the back here. Um, and the other thing, so just to build on that, when I thought about, when I think about conversational AI, I'm thinking about a conversation. When I think about generative AI, I'm thinking about a written interaction. And so for me, for example, um, and I don't think I had it up here, but I'm sure I had it in my notes here. That's why I mentioned the IVR because that's a really great place for conversational AI to accelerate. It's also really good for speech analytics. So if you don't have a, some, some of you might not have a quality program, you just depend on speech analytics, integrated with AI, it's using this very same technology. Generative AI, for me, is the most appealing for obviously chat interactions, both virtual and live. And I think the, the place it can make the biggest impact in contact centers is knowledge management. 
This, for me, continues to be probably the most broken asset that a frontline employee has to depend on to do their job that they couldn't do when I was in touch with Hilton yesterday. It was clear, because they had to keep going, oh, let me talk to my manager. Let me talk to my manager. That happened four times. Four times I was on hold, four interactions, still didn't get the resolution I wanted. They were really a pain, but we got there eventually. Shouldn't have had to talk to the manager once. If they had chat GPT right there, the questions I asked were really simple, didn't have them, or was too scared to give an answer. So that for me is where I think generative AI will play a role. Um, let me also share just one thing here. Okay, no, this is the one. So for conversational AI, a couple of quick other thoughts. Um, the interpretation of the machine is really important, especially in an IVR. So this notion of cadence and tone and how it's working to pick things up. In what I've seen through experience, this technology is much better than traditional speech recognition on picking up the nuances of how we speak. So when you're in an IVR, if it's done the right way, it should be much more successful than traditional speech. So that's one thing I wanted to point out for this team. Um, and then for generative AI, just bear with me for one sec. So I wanna build on Heather's point a little bit. So if we break out, just looking at these specific technologies, um, and you kind of hit on this a little bit, it's like you almost, you almost looked at these notes. Um, this notion of text and numbers shared in real time. So there's this, it's this continuous growth through information that's fed. And then these three different areas, these networks, processors, and encoders. Um, one is really focused on accuracy, which is the generative adversarial network. That's where it's really trying to make sure that whatever it's gonna spit out is a true answer to the inquiry that's been made. The transformers are doing some funky stuff. I'm not even sure if I'd really articulate with intelligence, um, but they're working with, it, it's kind of a, a sister or brother to the generative adversarial network. And then finally these encoders, it's like the last piece of the puzzle um, to make it all come together. I'm not sure if that helped at all, but I thought I'd just share that. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. I love the way you frame that. Yes. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Um, uh, yes, please, Kim. Um, one, of the, one of the first things I, I, I didn't understand about generative AI was the, um, I think it's the contextual piece we were just talking about, the hallucination effect of like adding context that isn't really there. Um, and then the other thing that I was thinking of was like the Right, you're guessing at contacts, and like, why would you want to do that to your customer? Um, but what I appreciated about it after spending time understanding the positive outcomes of that with like hallucinations is using those prior experiences to build that hallucination of like how mm -hmm. often are like Google searching, right? How often are people asking that question? There, more the hallucination is what likely are they asking you? And yeah. Therefore, the, the ability to get smarter. Is, is so fast and mm -hmm. it's rooted in the data mm. that you want to use. Anyway. Speed. Thank yeah. you for saying that. The speed. Yeah, that's a great point. Mm -hmm. so it's probably just the word. I could, go, I could go so many places with that comment, Kim, but I'm going <laughs> to, I'll park it for a sec. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're making me, you're giving me a whole different interpretation. It's chat GPT right now. Can you imagine if you're hallucinating and you're getting hallucination through the technology? Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, other comments, thoughts uh, on either generative and chat or conversational or anything else I talked about just before uh, we wrap? Am I okay on time? I keep looking at Dave because I know he's watching my clock. Okay. Anything else? Good. Marco, anything? So much knowledge there. I can feel you tempted to share something. Going to hang on to the panel? Okay. All right. That's fair. Okay. Good. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, and thank you for, to our clients, many of who are here today. And for those of you who are coming to visit for the first time, we are humbled by your presence. And we uh, really hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you so much.